So I'm at Answers in Genesis Creation Museum, and I'm with Ken Ham. Thank you, Ken, for being willing to be interviewed this morning. You are, pleasure. You are an articulate defender of the faith, and I very much appreciate uh, having this time with you. Well, we do our best to call people back to the authority of God's Word, so I uh, appreciate you trying to get the message out. Excellent. Tell us a little bit about the story of how you got into the creation ministry. Well, it sort of goes back millions of years, if you know what <laughs> right. I mean. Uh, but of course, I don't believe in millions of years. Actually, it goes back to my time in Australia, being brought up in a family with a mother and father who really stood on the authority of the Word of God. My father was a school teacher, and he was one who was always defending the Christian faith. In fact, when he was in hospital dying, he passed away a number of years ago, but he told us that because his father died when he was 16, that he didn't have an earthly father then, so he read the words of his heavenly father over and over again. So my father was Very saturated in the word of God. When you think about Australia, which is a pagan country, less than 1% will be born again Christians. So we brought up in a home with a father and mother who so stood on God's word, uh, was really such a blessing that I praise the Lord for. My father would never knowingly compromise the word of God. He always would be emphatic about, you know, when people say things that contradict the Bible, you always go to the Bible, make sure you understand what it's saying correctly. But the bottom line is, if there's still that conflict, then it's man's word that's the problem. It's not God's word mm -hmm. that's the problem. You always need to stand on God's word. You never change God's word to fit in man's word. So I grew up in that sort of home with an, an emphasis on, really it was apologetics. You know, my father was one, he didn't use the word apologetics, but he was always defending the Christian faith against liberal theology. Mm -hmm. He was a lay preacher in the church as well. And also, he was one who taught us to never compromise God's word, never put man in authority over God's word, always put God's word in authority so, over man's word. I did, so, not, I did not know that. He was a lay preacher. So uh, was that for a number of years? Was he, did he have a second job? Is well, well, he was a uh, principal of a uh, school. Okay. Uh, the equivalent of what you call elementary middle school over here in the United States, primary school in Australia. And he was transferred from town to town as he was promoted. So we usually end up in town for three years because that's the minimum time you have before you're promoted. And he was always so very good and his reports were so very good he got promoted every three years. But my parents started Sunday schools. Often in some of the towns they went to where there were no Sunday schools, there might even be one or two churches or even no churches in that area. Mm -hmm. And so they would start Sunday schools, they would bring in missionaries, usually from the open air campaign. It's a mission organization started in Australia so that they could have children here uh, the Word of God, children and adults, but they wow. love to hear yeah. children. Well, that is interesting, just how uh, how the beginning years were right. so formative for the rest of your life and, mm -hmm. and all that has gone on now as a result of the seeds that your father was planting in those years. And then since then, you came to America and uh, you, I think you began with ICR and Henry Morris? Yes. Well, what happened was that in Australia, when I became a teacher, a public high school teacher, there were some of the students that said, so how can you believe the Bible when we know the Bible's not true? Why is it not true? Because of what they were taught in their textbooks about evolution in millions of years. And that really was the time the Lord placed a real burden on my heart to get information to these students. And then I started speaking in churches and found many people in churches didn't believe God's word in Genesis, thought you could believe in evolution. And the Lord just kept intensifying that burden. I call mm. it a, a fire in my bones. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. out of that came okay. a, an apologetics ministry in Australia that started in our home. And then I came over to America on the invitation of Master Books, which was right. the publisher of many of the mm -hmm. creation apologetics materials. And when I was over here, visited ICR, visited with Dr. Henry Morris, Dr. Dwayne Gish, and Dr. Morris asked if I would come over to America to help them get the message out to the churches. They had scientists who were good at doing scientific research and speaking on technical issues, but mm -hmm. they really needed to be able to reach the church. And I realized that really America was then, certainly, the center of the Christian world and the center of the business world. And if you're going to really get a message out, the place to do it from is America. And so we agreed that we would come over and we came over uh, in 1987 to begin working with the Institute for Creation Research, worked with them for seven years. And then instead of returning to Australia, the Lord had increasingly intensified my burden to have a creation museum. In fact, hmm. it was probably about 35 years ago that I and one of our board members in Australia knelt down on a piece of property in Australia and prayed 
for a creation museum. Uh, we didn't know that would be answered many, many years later in America, in Northern Kentucky, uh, <laughs> and here we are sitting in the Creation That's Museum. Right. It is a real yes. answer uh, to prayer. You know, our ways are not God's ways, and His thoughts are far above our thoughts. But nonetheless, the vision for the Creation Museum goes way back then. I used to take my students when I was a teacher to museums and was always hmm. burdened that they're all from an evolutionist perspective. And, right. and God intensified that burden and kept intensifying that hmm. when I was over here working with the Institute for Creation Research. So after working with them for seven years, there were three of us that moved out to Northern Kentucky to begin the Ministry of Answers in Genesis, specifically with the purpose of building the Creation Museum. And you know, here we are in 2013, it's been open for six years and we've had nearly two million people come through the Creation Museum, being a mm -hmm. tremendous mm -hmm. vehicle to get information out to people concerning mm -hmm. the truth of God's Word in Genesis and the Gospel based in that history. Very much so. It's uh, really fascinating to kind of be here, to experience uh, the museum itself. It's, it's uh, extremely well done, excellent displays, information, uh, mul uh, very creative multimedia, so, and you're not a person with small vision. You have another, another project uh, coming right now having to do with Noah's Ark. Can you explain that? Certainly. I mean, when we look at the Creation Museum and the tremendous success that it's been, people still pouring into the Creation Museum every day, reaching two million people here directly at, at the Creation Museum. You know, our burden is, but how do we reach many more people? And, you know, as we ha were considering this, even when we were building the Creation Museum as part of our strategic plan, we were saying, what could be the next step to really make a big impact on the mm, culture? Right. And I think the Lord had put it on a number of our hearts, a burden to why not rebuild Noah's Ark? Uh, and, and, and in other words, uh, why not build Noah's Ark the way it's described in the Bible, out of wood, you know, the actual dimensions, as a witness to the world that God's word is true? You see, the cross is the greatest symbol of salvation. But other than the cross, I think Noah's Ark is the greatest reminder of salvation. Because you think about it, Noah and his family had to go through a doorway mm -hmm. to be saved. Mm -hmm. We need to go through a doorway. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he'll be saved. And so we set out to build Noah's Ark, as it's described in the Bible, out of wood, as a real boat, so to speak, and you know the th the three fours, and to have walk through exhibits mm -hmm. with an emphasis uh, using exhibits and also a theatre uh, emphasis on the door and how we need to go through a door to be saved, but answering many of the most asked questions. You know, as as we travel around the world, we get asked questions all the time, and they're usually the same sort of questions concerning the Bible and this era of history. But none of them relate to Noah's Ark such as, wait a minute, Noah couldn't fit all the animals on the ark. How could he fit those animals on board? There's no way. He couldn't feed them. He couldn't look after them. You couldn't build a boat out of wood that big. It would be impossible. And not only that, mm -hmm. there's no evidence for a global flood. I mean, where's the evidence over the earth for a global flood? Of course, there's plenty of evidence. We have billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. That's right. The fossil record really points uh, to the evidence of the flood, uh, to crying out that God has judged this world with a flood, and he's going to judge again, but next time by fire. And of course, we need to have an ark of salvation uh, to survive the coming judgment, right? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ is that ark of salvation. So, you know, we did Fantastic the, we, metaphor we, we the did the research, and we had America's research group go out. They, they actually were the ones that did some research for us, and they predicted we'd have about 400,000 people the first year the Creation Museum, the museum. Mm -hmm. and we had 404,000 people, so <laughs> they were very, very close. Well, we asked them to go out and do a general population study in America. If we did build Noah's Ark, would you come? And without going into all the details, it basically mm -hmm. comes mm -hmm. down to they predict about two million people a year would come to Noah's Ark, would probably at least double the attendance at the Creation Museum. Think oh, about it. we'd also have... Uh, additional effects back oh, with absolutely. the Creation Museum. I, I right. think everyone who goes to the Creation Museum would go, come to Noah's Ark, but not everyone who goes to Noah's Ark would necessarily go to the Creation Museum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because 60% of those that would come to Noah's Ark, the statistics indicate, would be unchurched. And they're already here in the area. If they're traveling from a fairly long distance, right. they would... Mm -hmm. right. They would certainly want to go to both facilities for you know, many of those people. Uh, but two million people a year. How, how many Christian facilities can reach 
two million people a year, 60% unchurched, with a very, very strong message concerning the authority of God's word in the gospel. Mm. I, I, I don't, yeah, I don't I see other, other mm -hmm. Christian facilities that could do that. What an incredible potential to outreach to this culture. Excellent. So getting back to the actual topic of what we're about in this particular video series, it's about evidence for creation. Mm -hmm. When you talk about uh, creation and you think about it, what do you consider to be the best evidence that you like to talk about? In what is the best evidence in favor of creation? We well, you know there's, there's two things that we need to consider when we're talking about this. Uh, for instance, we could talk about all sorts of design arguments. You know, we mm -hmm. could talk about the design of the eye or the design of the ear. One of my favorite examples from Australia, uh, the platypus. You know, when it was first discovered in 1797, then they sent it back to England. The scientists there thought somebody had found all these different animals and <laughs> cut them all up and stitched them all together uh, to, to make some sort of animal up. Mm. And they thought it was a fraud. And, uh, because they couldn't believe that you could have an animal like this, you know, with a, with a bill like a duck and beaver like tail and hair like a bear, web feet like an otter, claws like a reptile, mm. uh, lays eggs like a turtle, spurs like a, a rooster, poison like a snake. I mean, I mean if, if it evolved, it must have evolved from everything, right? And as I tell kids, you know, I, the platypus is my favorite animal, and one of the reasons is I, I believe that it's, uh, uh, it, it's an incredible little creature. Uh, because God made it just for the atheists, uh, just to confuse them. Uh, but, but see, we could talk about those sorts of design arguments and so on, but ultimately, what does that mean if we're not directing people to the real God who created those things? And really, the best evidence in that sense is His Word, uh, which starts, in the beginning God created. You know, if we just convince people that there's a Creator, and we don't direct them to who that creator is, we've got to remember something. His word tells us the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Uh, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that seeks after him. In other words, our heart is against God. And so if we just talk about creation and direct people to the evidence for creation, which it's all around us. I mean, Romans 1 says, if you don't believe, it's without you without excuse because it's so obvious. Mm -hmm. But yes. if that's all we do, obviously, then our heart is we don't want the true creator, so we're likely to go after a false God. Mm -hmm. And that's why we've got to remember God's word, which says that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It's God's word mm -hmm. that convicts. It's not mm -hmm. man's word that convicts, it's God's word that convicts. It's God's word that's sharper than a two-edged sword. And so what we do, for instance, the Creation Museum and Answers in Genesis, and in fact, you know, we're doing this interview right here in the Wonders Room, which I, I really call the intelligent design room of Answers in Genesis because we have all sorts of evidences in here concerning biology and astronomy and so on uh, that point to the fact that it's obvious that there's a creator but then we point people to who the creator is the Lord Jesus Christ uh, the one uh, that we're told in in his word who stepped That's into right. history to be yes. a man to die on the cross be raised from the dead and so we use it to point people to the true God and appoint people to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And so it is fun and it is exciting using all sorts of evidences like the platypus right. and lots mm -hmm. of other yes. uh, creatures. And when we look at plants and look at astronomy, this, uh, I mean, Romans 1 is so obvious. Mm -hmm. So if you don't mm -hmm. believe in God, you mm -hmm. are without excuse. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, the best evidence is God himself mm -hmm. has given us his word. And the very first sentence says, in, in the, beginning. the beginning, God created and it's obvious when we look around us that that is so. See there's another aspect when we're talking to non-Christians in particular that we have to be very careful about. Sometimes I hear Christians say, well I talk to my non-Christian friends and I say, can't you see this beautiful world God created and look at all the beautiful examples of design out there, you know, look at the butterfly or look at, you know, hummingbird or whatever and I say that's true but, and, and, and that's good but at the same time, those non-Christians are looking at this world and they're seeing that someone just shot a lot of people in a facility and killed them and there's a lot of death and suffering. Or that there were massive floods in a, in a particular state in America that killed a lot of people. Or that there's earthquakes or a tsunami that hits Japan or a tsunami that hits Indonesia and all these children that die. Because we also got to reminded that it was once a very beautiful world. It was once perfectly good. It was mm -hmm. once all beautiful, 
But now, because of our sin, it's marred. So we live in a fallen world. And so we've got to be careful that if we just point to the world and say, can't you see God created? Then a non-Christian says, well, that creator must be an ogre. Look at all the death in the world. Look at all the bloodshed. Mm -hmm. Look at all the That's suffering. Right. But when you're looking through his word, we understand, wow, you can imagine what it must have been like originally, the beauty that must have been there. Even in a fallen world, because of our sin, that's now groaning, as Paul says in Romans 8, because of sin, because of the fall, even in a groaning world, we still see beauty. We see evidence of God's design, but we also see a lot of evidence of the fall, mm -hmm. evidence of sin and the corruption that's occurred and to be reminded of what mm -hmm. our sin did. We did that. I'd like to talk about that some more. Uh, one of the issues that I'm concerned about is the uh, strong influence of old earth, the old earth tendencies. Um, I'm not sure when it exactly took over. It seems like uh, I don't know, the last 10, 20 years, it almost seems that the predominant uh, view today uh, of, of creationists is some form of old earth. There's um, Hugh Ross, he has, he's probably the most, um, the person who has done more to advance uh, old earth creationism than anyone that, that I would know of. And so he has, you've debated him. I've, been, I've enjoyed watching you on YouTube and some of those debates. And one of the things that he brings up is that he seems to say that he agrees that with the authority of scripture, that it's inspired and that it's inerrant. Uh, and he agrees that Adam and Eve sinned and that there was a curse. But he also says that the curse only applies to people. Uh, now, the Bible, Genesis 3, 17, tells us uh, the curse was on the earth, was to the, the ground, I believe. How do you respond to his assertion that it only applies to people? Well, first of all, Paul makes it very clear in Romans 8. If you read Romans 8, you know, 20, 21, 22, 23, it's very obvious that the whole of creation groans. It groans. Uh, it's suffering because of our sin and it's waiting for the time that God is going to restore everything. There's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. The whole of creation groans. In fact, you know, when you go back to Genesis, it says, cursed be the ground. So obviously the ground was cursed. It's not going to yield food to us like it used to. In fact, it's going to be hard to work to get food, which it is, mm -hmm. and there's going to be thorns. And, and now we have to struggle with weeds, we have to struggle mm -hmm. with thorns. Thorns came into existence. Uh, because of the curse. Remember, when God created everything, referring to the whole of the six days, which means uh, when, when you're looking at the sun, moon, and stars, uh, you know, the universe, uh, when you, you're considering the earth and the plants and the sea creatures and the flying creatures and all the land creatures, as well as Adam and Eve, then God looked at everything and he said it was very good. Now, when you look at the world today and you see animals are ripping into each other, animals even eating people uh, and, and so on, would God call that very good? I mean, in the New Testament, when a man came to Jesus and said, good master, he said, why do you call me good? There's only one good, and that is God. Yes. The yes. definition of good, really, is God, because is God really. is the one who is mm -hmm. all good. He is perfect. He is without sin. The mm -hmm. Bible mm -hmm. makes that very clear. You know, in the fossil record, which people like Hugh Ross and other old earthers would accept was laid down millions of years before man, because that's what the secular scientists tell us, the fossil record, which we believe most of it's from the flood of Noah's day, just 4,300 odd years ago. But they're saying it was laid down millions of years before man. Now, remember, it was after God created man, he said everything, that's the whole of what he did in the creation week, was very good. Well, if you're a Christian and you accept that the fossil record, as we see it today, was laid down millions of years before man, then God called all that very good. Now, what's in the fossil record? Evidence of brain tumors in dinosaur bones, cancer, arthritis. Are you saying that God called cancer very good? Mm -hmm. uh, there's evidence of animals eating each other. Mm -hmm. You know, you read Genesis chapter 1, mm -hmm. verse 29 and 30. Adam and Eve were told to eat fruit, and it said the animals ate plants. Now, when we go to Genesis 9, 3, after the flood, God said to, to Noah, just as I gave you the plants, in other words, it was establishing, yes, they were vegetarian originally, now I give you the animals as well. Now you can eat all things, everything. 
Uh, so God made a change in our diet. And it's very obvious that originally Adam and Eve were only vegetarian. Verse 30 of chapter 1 in Genesis is written in the same way as verse 29. Verse 30 is written about the animals. It's obvious the animals are vegetarian. Mm -hmm. You know, in the fossil record, there's evidence of bones in animal stomachs and that they were chomping on each other and so on. And so, you know, just from that perspective, from perspective of mm -hmm. looking at the fossil record, comparing it to scripture, we see that there's no way that that fossil record existed millions of years before man. It had to come after man, which makes sense. You know, if there really was a global flood, what would you expect to find? Exactly what you see in the fossil record. Billions of dead things buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth, sawed down into various layers, according to the hydrodynamics of sorting, and that sort of thing. You know, I, I really believe that, uh, you know, when it comes down to why do so many Christians, Christian scholars, Christian leaders believe in an old earth, I believe a lot of it comes down to peer pressure, even academic pride, and it, and, it, and it comes down to an intimidation by the world. You see, they think, many of them think, and I've heard them say this, that if you don't believe in millions of years, you're denying science. And here's the problem. The problem is the word science itself, it, the root meaning of it means knowledge. Mm -hmm. And really there's a couple of different types of knowledge. You can uh, gain knowledge by observation, which builds our technology. And it doesn't matter whether you're an atheist or a Christian, you can be involved in building the space shuttle or building a jet airplane or making cameras for, uh, so we can interview people or, or whatever it is. Uh, that technology comes out of observational science. There's a different sort of knowledge when you're talking about our origins, when you weren't there, when no one was there. Mm -hmm. We weren't there to see the earth form. We weren't there to see God make Adam and Eve. Well, we weren't. We, we weren't there to see these things. Well, evolutionists weren't there to see, uh, you know, these layers supposedly laid down over millions of years. When you go to the Grand Canyon, those layers exist today. You didn't see them being laid down. I mean, I could go to the Grand Canyon with an evolutionist, and we look at the Coconino sandstone, and we agree, this is a sandstone, because you're mm -hmm. observing it in the present. But then, if the evolutionist said, and it was laid down over so many million years, well, how do you know that? You can't get out a little tape and measure that. Mm -hmm. uh, there's know, no and, labels indicating the year. There's no right. labels, mm -hmm. and, and all dating methods are based on assumptions. And the problem is, because the one word science is used by the secular world to talk about historical science, knowledge about the past, mm -hmm. and talk about observational science that mm -hmm. builds our technology, mm -hmm. then many people today, even many Christians and many Christian scholars think, if we don't believe in millions of years, we're denying the science that build our technology, and that's just absurd. That's they just, just lump true. it. They just lump it all together. They lump it all together, and, and, and it's sort and of an intimidation people, technique, yes, a brainwashing technique, mm -hmm. and un unfortunately, many people have succumbed to that. And you know, we we also cannot cannot ignore the state of man. Right? Mm -hmm. The Bible tells us we're sinners. Uh, even Paul grappled with the fact that that. We should do, he doesn't, and that's which, which he doesn't do, he should, should, mm -hmm. and so on. In other words, even as Christians, we still uh, live in this, this sinful state and looking forward to that time when, when we get out of these uh, bodies and mm -hmm. the new heavens and new earth. And, and because of that, I think people struggle. We've got to remember something that even the best of Christians, our heart is we don't want to believe the truth. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have to understand that, and I think that's why so many of them are so easily swayed. We're giving in the heart is to our nature. desperately wicked. Yeah. One of the things that I think is so important here, I've heard you talking about in the past, um, where if if God had created things over millions of years or billions of years, and you have all these dead things, where animals and plants and, and are dying and disease over the years, then who's responsible for that? Well, it would be God. God is the designer. You'd have all of the extinctions. And so, you know, well, is God, you know, doing a trial and error kind of a process? Or, I mean, does he really know what he's doing? For, whereas if it's a young earth perspective, then uh, the cause for all this death and disease is really falls back on uh, Adam and Eve or human, you know, humankind. What's, what's interesting, you know, when you go back to the garden in Genesis 3, uh, what happened? Uh, because Adam took the fruit. Well, Adam blamed Eve, Eve blamed the serpent. And you know, we have that nature, that sin nature of Adam. We're just like Adam. And so, really, we want to blame someone else. Now, if you think about it, when we look at this world and see all the death and suffering, if you believe in millions of years, 
then God's responsible for all the death and suffering. And one of the big questions asked in the world today is, how do you know there's a loving God? Look at all the death and suffering in the world. Because the implication is, if there is a God, it's his fault. But the Bible makes it very clear that it's our fault because we sinned against a holy God. <clears throat> Actually, God stepped into history to rescue us from what we did. He stepped into history to be a man, 100% uh, man but 100% God, the God man, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, be raised from the dead, to rescue us from what we did. And that's the exciting part of the message. So I want to I want to quote uh, a very famous apologist, Christian apologist, William Lane Craig. Mm -hmm. He wrote, now, I think this is in a blog. It was like a video blog or something um, is where this came from uh, a little less than a year ago. Now, when you think about that, Kevin, this is just hugely embarrassing that over half of our ministers really believe that the universe is really 10,000 years old. This is just scientifically, it's nonsense. And yet this is the view that the majority of our pastors hold. It's really quite shocking when you think about it. Well, you, you know, William Lane Craig is looked on today as one of the leading apologists, Christian apologists yes. in, in America. And of course, he's associated with uh, Biola Talbot uh, there in uh, California. You know, I would, I would challenge Dr. William Lane Craig that what he's really doing is he's really having, he's really allowing one hermeneutic for Genesis 1 to 11 and a different hermeneutic for the rest of the Bible because if you were to say to him, you know, do you believe Jesus Christ rose from the dead? He would say, of course he did, or the virgin birth, of course. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I certainly would never challenge the fact that, you know, Dr. William Lane Craig is a Christian. Uh, the age of the earth is not a salvation Very issue, yes. but it is an authority issue. And I believe it is a gospel issue too, because when you believe in millions of years, then you've got death and bloodshed before sin. You're blaming God for death and bloodshed, whereas the foundation of understanding the gospel is it's Adam's sin and our sin in Adam that brought death and bloodshed. So you're really undermining the foundation of the gospel in that sense. And also you're impugning the character of God because mm -hmm. you're blaming God for death and suffering instead of blaming our sin for death and suffering. So there's that aspect to it. But the other thing is this, Look, Richard Dawkins, he's an atheist, or Lawrence Krauss from Arizona State University, yes. they're yes. atheists, yes. and they are so anti-God. Yes. Now, they mock the resurrection, mm -hmm. and they would mock the virgin birth. Mm -hmm. Now, if I said to William Lane Craig, should we take what Richard Dawkins believes about the resurrection and then reinterpret the resurrection in the Bible, or what he believes about the virgin birth and reinterpret that. And he would say, absolutely not. This is the word of God. I'm sure that's what he would say, right? You, you need to take God's word as written. Well, why is it that you won't do that there, but you will take what Richard Dawkins believes about origins and what Lawrence Krauss believes about origins, you'll mm -hmm. take what they believe and reinterpret Genesis. That's called eisegesis. And one of the things reading that I would accuse, scripture. reading into yes. scripture, one of the things that I would accuse many of our modern day Christian scholars of doing is they have one hermeneutical principle for Genesis 1 to 11, mm -hmm. and that's eisegesis, where they're really starting outside of scripture mm -hmm. and going to scripture. And yet for the rest of the Bible, they would never do that. Mm -hmm. For the rest of the Bible, it's exegesis. You always start from scripture. Mm -hmm. And you see, why do they do that? Again, I believe it comes down to an intimidation by the world. You realize, you know, we, we, we've had ardent evolutionists here at the Creation Museum. And, you know, evolutionists from the media, uh, we've had a lot of secular media here. And when they're interviewing me for programs, they often don't ask many questions about evolution. It's mainly about the age of the earth. Uh, and you know why that is? And, and in fact, whenever the media represents or misrepresents in many ways, uh, answers in Genesis out there, when they you know, comment on Answers in Genesis. It's not, well, this, this is an organization that doesn't believe in evolution and they don't believe, you know, what was written in Darwin's book and so on. It's usually, this is that organization that believes in six days and believes dinosaurs and people lived at the same time and doesn't believe in millions of years. It's always the emphasis of the age of the earth. Because if you think about it, if you don't have millions of years, you can't even postulate the idea of evolution. You've got to have That's an incomprehensible right. amount of time That's right. to be even to, able to suggest the idea of Darwinian evolution. So if they don't have millions of years, 
the, the, the whole system collapses. Mm -hmm. They've got to have millions of years. Mm -hmm. And they have really, mm -hmm. I believe, intimidated many of these great mm -hmm. Christian scholars yes. who are brilliant men yes. who love the Lord, yes. uh, who I believe will be in heaven, heaven with me. Yeah. But I believe yeah. they've been so intimidated by the world to believe that if you don't believe in millions of years, that is unscientific, you're not being academic, you're mm -hmm. anti-intellectual. Mm -hmm. And again, they misunderstand this word science. They don't realize that there's a difference between knowledge about the past, historical science, and observational science, which involves using your five senses in the present that can develop our technology. When it comes to the age of the earth, when William Craig says to believe that uh, you know, things are only thousands of years old is scientific nonsense, uh, you know, what does he mean by that? Can he prove the age of the earth is billions of years old? Uh, he can't prove that. You can't scientifically prove that. That's really a belief. All the dating methods they use are based on fallible assumptions concerning the past. Dating mm -hmm. methods involve a change with time, but you have to assume things about what was there originally when you weren't there and what's happened over time. Mm -hmm. Those assumptions are all fallible. There's only one infallible dating method. It's the Word of God. Amen. And when we take God at His Word, if you just take the Bible as written, take God at His Word in Genesis, then God created in six literal days. The word for day, the Hebrew word yom, is qualified by evening, morning, number. It, it means an ordinary day in context in Genesis 1. Adam was made on day six, and then you have all these genealogies. When you add up all those dates, you get thousands of years. You don't get millions of years. You also read that the animals were vegetarian originally. Everything God made was very good. Thorns came after the curse. And so it's very, very obvious that you can't have thorns and animals eating each other millions of years before sin. Not only that, everything God made was very good. There wasn't any death or bloodshed in the world. Now plants are different, of course, because plants were given for food and plants don't have a nephesh. Uh, the Hebrew word nephesh, mm -hmm. which means life spirit, applies to animals and man, but not to plants. Mm -hmm. So they didn't die right. in that sense. So, mm -hmm. so when we say there's no death before the fall, we mean no nephesh death, mm -hmm. uh, no life spirit death. Mm -hmm. uh, no death of animals or man. Uh, plants were given for food. Plants are totally different. They, they're not alive like animals. So mm -hmm. when we look at all that, it's totally consistent, starting with scripture, to say it was a perfect world, animals, man, or vegetarian, living in perfect harmony, no thorns, and there was no death or bloodshed of nephesh creatures, but Adam's sin changed all that. As soon as you say that uh, the millions of years of death and bloodshed occurred before man, you're undermining the authority of scripture. And that's what I would challenge William Lane Craig with. It's not a salvation issue. You know, the Bible doesn't say you have to believe in a young earth to be saved. But nonetheless, it is an authority issue. And if you tell generations of young people, you don't need to take this book as written here, you can take man's ideas and reinterpret it. Why shouldn't they take man's ideas about marriage and reinterpret marriage? Isn't that what some of them are doing in our churches? Uh, now to defend gay marriage. And why shouldn't they start to say, well, if you can't trust this bit, why should we trust that bit? Two thirds of young people are walking away from the church by the time they reach college age mm -hmm. in America today. And I, I believe it's even worse than that in other of our Western nations. Why? Because the church hasn't stood on the authority of the word of God and has allowed the world to capture their hearts and minds and cause them to doubt and then not believe the authority of the word beginning in Genesis. And by the way, every single biblical doctrine of theology, directly or indirectly, is founded in Genesis. Why did Jesus Christ die on a cross? Why is he called the last Adam? Mm -hmm. Why is marriage a man and a woman? I mean, even in Matthew 19, Jesus asked about marriage. He said, Hadn't you, haven't you read, he which made the beginning made the male and female, and, and you become one flesh. He quotes from Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2. Why do we wear clothes? Why do we need a new heavens and new earth? All of those have their foundation in Genesis. Mm -hmm. I just really think it's sad that Craig is essentially using the argument that evolutionists use, which is to shame people, which is to make them feel that, well, you're inferior or you're even stupid if you believe in the, uh, creation and evidence for creation. There is so much abundant evidence. I mean, it is clearly everywhere. Right. And we, that is what we're doing is showing uh, our video project is to make it very, very clear for people that they can see that the evidence is growing and abundant uh, as modern science has developed uh, what we know about DNA in the last 60 or 70 years. It's only been in the last 60 or 70 years. It, it's, it's fairly new. And so um, it, it's so very powerful. And so for him to use that as a tool, it's like just 
falling into the same hands of what the evolutionists have already done. I just find it to be uh, very uh, appalling. Well, you know, there is a verse of scripture that sums it up in a way too. There's nothing new under the sun. Because when you read the scripture and you read, for instance, through the Minor Prophets, uh, the shepherds were doing the same thing in that day. They were taking the pagan religion of the day and incorporating it uh, into what God had told them and sort of mixing the two together. Mm -hmm. And remember what God said to them, you can bring your sacrifices, you can have all your praise music and so on, but uh, I'm not, I don't hear your prayers. And the reason I don't, because you don't obey my word. And I believe that's the challenge for people today. We need to obey uh, God's word, because that's the bottom line. I mean, that, that's what it's all about. It really does come down to an authority issue. And it's true, the evidence for creation is obvious, even looking at DNA. DNA is a code system, an information mm -hmm. system. Codes mm -hmm. only come from intelligence. Information only from information. It certainly cries out uh, that in the beginning, God, uh, but we also need to point people to the fact that God has revealed himself in his word and it's his word that saves. So we can use that evidence to point them to who the real God is. It's obvious as a creator, let us introduce you to who that creator is. I completely agree with you. The best evidence for creation is God's word itself. Thank you so much, Ken, for taking the time hey, to thank interview you. with me. I appreciate it. Great, it's been a pleasure.